welcome to the session and uh, thanks for coming. I'm aware there's at least one other big crowd puller actually uh, this afternoon. So I appreciate your, your interest in this topic and, and also your, your participation. Um, this is the um, agroecology discussion tent after all. So we are hoping for a discussion um, as part of the, uh, as a big part of this uh, hour that we have uh, on the topic of agroforestry. And um, so I'll introduce the um, other panelists in a minute, but the subject of our session is what will it take for agroforestry to become commonplace on English farms? There's already been quite a lot about uh, integrating trees intentionally into your, your farming operation for its um, kind of economic benefits as well as the, the ecological benefits and, and other you know, communi community benefits even. And there was a fantastic session yesterday about um, what we've learned so far um, from um, practicing agroforestries like Stephen. And, um, and I think some really compelling examples of how agroforestry can work at so many different levels um, for the farmer. And what we're going to be thinking about to, uh, this afternoon is what is the potential to, to see this uh, approach to land management uh, growing significantly um, in the future. I think it's true to say there's a sort of a real explosion of interest in uh, trees on farms. And we've been seeing that over the last months and indeed years. And at the same time, we're uh, anticipating the, the full introduction of the Environmental Land Management Schemes, ELM, ELM. And so it's a fantastic opportunity, in a sense, to match the two and to look at what support ELM can provide farmers to um, encourage them to adopt agroforestry and adopt it successfully. Um, and it's an opportunity we want to get right. Um, there's plenty of ways it can go wrong. And so that's why the agroforestry um, ELM test project, um, as part of DEFRA's tests and trials, have been working with farmers to actually and learn from the grassroots what will work for them in terms of uh, incentives to take up agroforestry. So uh, on that project are um, my colleagues here on the, on the stage. Um, so we have Helen Cheshire, who's the lead farming advocate at uh, the Woodland Trust. Uh, we have Stephen Briggs, who, along with Ian Nice from Abacus Agriculture, um, is a, uh, practices agroforestry on his own farm in Cambridgeshire, Whitehall Farm and has been a leading advocate for, for some years um, and really influential in that sense. And then we've got Ben Raskin, who also um, has been incredibly um, important in, in driving this agroforestry agenda over, the, over recent times, partly from his practice of agroforestry at Eastbrook Farm. So it's fantastic to, to have the experience that we've got here on the panel. Um, also on the project is my, my colleague, Colin Tosh, who some of you might have come across and was here at Groundswell yesterday. So, um, oh, and my name is Will Simonson, and I'm, I should say, and I'm from the Organic Research Centre. So I think that's all the uh, introductions. Um, and what I'd like to do is, first of all, just present a few slides about what we've been doing in this project and the kind of headline findings from that. Um, and then, as part of that, open up uh, to my colleagues for some sort of commentary on various aspects of those findings. But then I want to have plenty of time uh, in the latter part of this session to, which, to hear from you, um, your comments, reactions to what we've been talking about, your experiences, the things that have either been barriers to you taking up agroforestry in the past or things that have worked for you and that you'd like to share. And in fact, this is all part of our evidence gathering for the, uh, for the test project, um, which runs until early next year. So we're seeing this as an opportunity to, to learn from you and hopefully you'll find out some things from us as well about the directions that things are going in. So um, this slide just sets out the, the objective of the, the project, um, which is more or less as I've been describing it. And it's looking at how can agroforestry be encouraged uh, within the, the ELM schemes in the future. Focusing on two policy areas in particular, there were a number that we could have chosen from, but we're, we've been focusing on advice and guidance and um, payment incentives. So we set off really um, basically doing a, a review of existing evidence on, on this topic. We, this was essentially a desk-based exercise looking at the 
the literature, from reports from um, a number of projects that have been running. Some of you have been aware of these big European collaborations, such as Affinet and Ag Forward, which have been looking at this, the potential of agroforestry across the whole continent, but have been really useful for, for the UK in terms of assessing what have some, been some of the barriers, but also opportunities for agroforestry in the past and what we can learn from that. Um, there's been a number of other sources, documents, reports, um, scientific literature that we've delved into to really actually come up with, the, in a sense, the base, baseline uh, evidence uh, upon which we could then build. So, and unsurprisingly, as this word cloud sort of shows, the sorts of things that were coming up really emphasized the, uh, the importance of focusing on payments, focusing on advice and guidance, because it's the, um, the establishment costs, the, um, uh, how those could be covered by available funding opportunities or the lack of them often. Uh, that's been one of the main issues for farmers. It's uh, considering the long-term nature of agroforestry and therefore of the costs associated with maintenance and management. So there's a whole set of things around the financial situation, um, but also around the sort of lack of knowledge. Uh, for a lot of farmers, this will be a completely new thing to be managing trees on their farms. Um, it's not their usual practice. So there's the kind of practical knowledge needed, the economic um, kind of knowledge, the business case side of things as well. So this was really coming up as one of the key, sort of the main issues, really. But there were others as well. Um, for example, uncertainty around the kind of policy legislation uh, context, the, the the synergies or clashes with other sort of farm level practices, and how those were being sort of understood and perceived. So that was what we sort of set off um, with by way of sort of background information. But the main sort of part of the, the project was really to set up six regional clusters of farms. Um, so in each cluster, there was a monitor farmer and five other cluster farmers. And as this map here shows, uh, each one uh, was in a diff different part of the country, but also importantly, looking at a different um, type of agroforestry as, as listed here. And um, we carried out interviews with these participating farmers to, again, build on the, the sort of information about their experience of ag agroforestry. Not all of them were practicing it. Some of them had been considered it, but not taken it up. And that in itself is useful to know and the reasons behind that. But at the core of the project uh, were a series of regional workshops, um, one in each of these uh, cluster regions that were held um, back in the autumn into the winter of last year and ending in January this year. And uh, so the, just a bit through where we were um, visiting. So um, we started off at Stevens Farm, Whitehall Farm in Cambridgeshire to look at silver arable. Then we moved up to Cumbria to visit Nick and Paul Renison with their upland silver pastoral um, farming that they're doing up there. Then we moved to the, the central region to FAI, FAI Farms near Oxford to consider uh, silver poultry, looking at the historic silver poultry system of uh, that farm. Then we were in the High Wheels of Sussex, to, uh, hosted by Mike Harding and, and Jason Lavender to consider woodland grazing and uh, wood pasture. And then in the southwest, Raphael Pomba and uh, Mariana Connell at the Dartington Estate and Apricot Centre hosted us to consider silver poultry systems. And finally, and this was the only one that had to move online because of a COVID disruption, but then we were with Tim, Tim Downs in Shropshire to consider lowland silver pasture. And in all these cases, it was an opportunity to see the, the trees in the fields themselves, to be inspired by actual examples uh, of agroforestry in practice, and, um, and then um, kind of stimulated up by that to have discussion um, on uh, kind of what farmers would um, need, in a sense, to be convinced to, to take it up, um, what kind of challenges they foresaw in doing that, um, what they would like to see within ELM in terms of supporting that. So um, we, during the course of those workshops, we took copious notes and um, we um, basically analyzed and synthesized those uh, in different ways uh, to actually come up with a, a set of recommendations. And I just want to sort of run through those. These will be, the, in a sense, the building blocks, the guiding principles, um, kind of main headline messages, if you like, to come out of our workshops. Um, so I'll present those quickly, and as I do so, I'm going to ask uh, for the, um, my colleagues here who help, were helping with these workshops to actually comment on some of the aspects that we were finding out. And um, as I said, after that, we'll be moving on to some uh, plenary open discussion with us all. So um, starting off with um, kind of recommendations relating to um, payments, 
And I guess the first two here um, might come across as fairly obvious, but it's really around the priority of supporting um, capital costs and shorter term maintenance costs. And to really be, in a sense, an enabler, any support through ELM should be enabling farmers to get onto the, the ladder, if you like, of, of agroforestry. Um, because this is where the, the funding can have the kind of catalytic effect uh, in terms of achieving wide-scale uptake. Because at the end of the day, it is a, a long-term investment. Um, and you know some of those economic benefits won't be coming down the line until a number of years after the establishment phase. And so this is where the funding support is really critical. But there's other kinds of funding that can be important too to facilitate uh, knowledge exchange between farmers, to undertake the research and monitoring aspects, um, and funding to, in a sense, develop kind of effective communities of practice that actually sort of self-supporting in terms of um, building on the momentum of agroforestry and its take up. So that's kind of the first point. And the second point, yes, I mean, as described, be enabling um, to recognize the, the longer term public goods delivery potential of agroforestry. Um, the practice down the line of capitalizing on markets for the carbon and biodiversity, et cetera, but therefore supporting that kind of establishment um, kind of phase, and that's where the public sort of funding can really come in. So the third recommendation is around being flexible. And, and this was an incredibly strong message to come out, I think, of all our workshops, that, that farmers don't want to be straight-jacketed into a, a scheme that you know, specifies planting densities or designs or whatever. Um, but you know, obviously, uh, agroforestry takes many different forms and expressions, and it has to be, in a sense, responsive to the, the kind of local conditions of the, the farm, the farmer's objectives in the first place. Um, and to be adaptively managed over time according to its performance, and potentially to have sort of, in a sense, branching options. So, you know, not to sort of set in stone a particular course of action through the course of the next 15 years, but to actually have the potential to sort of choose different avenues as, as depending on how things are going and which parts of the system are working better or not. Fourth recommendation here is um, not implying... Um, or in requiring a, a sort of permanent change of land use. So obviously trees are long-term propositions, um, more so than a lot of the kind of crops that are going to be grown, of course, on the farm. Uh, so they are long-term assets, and it's important in, in the sense of the, the biodiversity and the carbon that they should be so. But I think uh, there's an important point in that um, farmers shouldn't, in a sense, have their future options closed down because they're, they're putting trees into their fields, and there shouldn't be a, a sort of a, a you know formal kind of change of classified land use, if you like, on those fields. Um, the fifth recommendation here is around spreading payments over time. So yes, the payments, the kind of capital cost support at the beginning are really important, but you know, there's also establishment that isn't just you know, the first couple of years, the, there's the sort of maintenance protection that's needed over a number of years, and so kind of stage payments through that whole process are really important and critical to achieving the, the you know, public goods benefits down the line. And finally, on this slide, rewarding ex existing practice. So farmers like, like Stephen and Ben and um, you know, David at Wakelands and wherever, that they shouldn't be excluded from the potential to capitalize potentially from uh, ELM payments. Um, and one way actually of rewarding that those pioneer farms is through potentially sort of funding their use as demonstration sites. And um, we'll come, be coming back to that topic again in a little, in a little bit. Um, so, and I'll just do the final, final four recommendations on the payment size before asking um, for some comment here from colleagues. But um, so, yeah, including monitoring of public goods benefits. Um, it's quite interesting to hear Henry Dimbleby yesterday making the point, um, I think, that, that for the sort of long term success and continuity of the whole kind of public money for public goods agenda, it's really going to be important to actually measure those, those benefits. Um, and to report on those, uh, Treasury won't be committed to the scheme if, if there isn't that evidence that it's working. So that, in a sense, was quite interesting to, to kind of hear from what we were also hearing from the, the farmers themselves, that they were also interested in that. It wasn't just a sort of tick-boxing sort of exercise in that. They were you know, truly motivated uh, to, to kind of improve the wildlife, the biodiversity, um, to be um, you know, locking up more carbon within their, their, their farm system. So that really came out, the importance of monitoring those, um, those public goods benefits, for which it is important to have standardized ways of doing, measuring, doing that measurement. And I think carbon is one area um, that's being talked about, a lot about at this event, isn't it, about how that can be done in the most effective way. 
Um, and then that feeds into recommendation eight about incorporating both outcomes and action-based payments. Um, potentially a blended approach. We discussed that a little bit, um, recognizing yeah the right reality again of the high startup costs, but you know incentivizing agroforestry such that you know farmers who are maximizing those, those environmental benefits are being rewarded um, appropriately. Number nine, making it easy um, as possible for tenant farmers and growers to to participate. Um, Perhaps we could have a bit of reflection from, from Stephen as a, a sort of ten farmer but on that point in, in a little while as well. And finally here, incorporating a tiered system of support, allowing for different levels of ambition. And that might be around sort of um, tree species diversity in the system. But other ways in which um, there could be uplift payments for practicing the, the agroforestry in ways that, that is actually, in a sense, fine-tuning that, that kind of uh, and improving the longer term um, uh, benefits. But it could also be about participating in research and monitoring, about sort of taking part in knowledge exchange um, and so on. Okay, I'm going to pause there and um, to save my voice a little bit and, and just ask, uh, first of all, Stephen. Um, I think many of you will be aware of Stephen's example of uh, his silver arable um, system in, in Cambridgeshire. But first of all, Stephen, can I ask you, um, by way of a bit of context, really, what was... I mean, the deciding factor for you, really, or probably a number of deciding factors that, that made you take the plunge uh, however many years it w ago it was, and it's quite a few now, isn't it? And can you just say a little bit about that as a sort of kind of inspiration, in a sense, for this part of the discussion? Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, well, for those of you that are uh, unfamiliar with what we're doing, we farm as tenant farmers on uh, county council holding in Cambridgeshire. Um, when we moved onto the farm in 2007, it was pretty evident that the soils were, frankly, knackered and, uh, at worst, blowing away with, uh, with some wind erosion. So one of our, one of our primary drivers to tr was to try and do something about soil protection. So a wind break, but I needed a wind break that would make me money because I needed to pay a rent. Because of the, the way we farm, mainly cereals with some vegetables, effectively what I wanted to do was create an alley cropping system which... Um, delivered on, on on that sort of wind, windbreak aspiration and soil protection uh, aspiration, but that something that I could get an economic return on within the lifetime of our ten tenancy of 15 years um, and, and also enhanced biodiversity, landscape, um, um, and, and diversified the farming enterprises and gave us sort of more resilience. So those were really our drivers, uh, and and from a business perspective, it was, about, it was about how much money can I invest in establishing 50 hectares of agroforestry, and what's that economic return going to look like? Um, so we, we actually, uh, at the time in 2009, we were somewhat limited to the choice that choices we could make. At that time, if we'd planted timber trees. Um, that would have contravened CAP rules in terms of land classification. It, so we would have taken land out of uh, arable productivity and put it into effectively woodland. Um, and my landlord would have uh, served us with a dilapidation clause in terms of change of land use. So that was one of the drivers. And that's no longer the case. Uh, you know, Things have moved on since then. And DEFRA now recognise, the RPA recognise agroforestry as a a valid land use. So that actually drove us down, actually selecting, we, we, cho we chose fruit, a fruit tree because it was an eligible crop, retained eligibility for the CAP and land use. We could add value in terms of short-term tenure and it delivered on the sort of windbreak and, and biodiversity aspects. So those those are really our drivers. Okay, thank you. And can I ask you what, what potential you, you see for yourself and other existing agroforesters in terms of um, potentially being able to benefit from the, the ELM schemes? Um, is, is that important for you in terms of your business? Yeah, so I mean, clearly, having done something 13 years ago at scale, it was a pretty punchy move. You know, some, some might say foolhardy, some might say inspirational, depending where you, where you sit on the spectrum. <laughs> um, but, but for many, I, I suspect for many, it's about de-risking the process. So de-risking in terms of knowledge. You know, what can you learn from how other, what other people have done? We've made plenty of mistakes. I shared some of those yesterday morning. 
um, how can you de-risk that process and how can you de-risk the investment? You know, it's, it's a substantial cost uh, of capital upfront investment with a longer term payback. Um, how can you de-risk some of that, that process? So I see SFI and local nature recovery as part of ELMS in its guise is to help de-risk some of that process, both from an advice and uh, an economic perspective. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Um, ben, could, could I ask you, um, again, as somebody who's you know, doing agroforestry at Eastbrook Farm, um, who's been thinking a lot about all of this for a long time, and in terms of the, the point about agroforestry, you know, it does provide benefits for the farmer in terms of marketable products down the line, um, efficiencies on the farm, sort of decreased cost of product production potentially on the farm, all the ecological sort of benefits. Um, and yet, um, and of course the public goods benefits as well. So I guess the question that I've, um, is in relation to what is appropriate for public finance to cover as opposed to sort of what the, uh, what the uh, farm themselves will be um, gaining from in terms of income uh, or savings. Um, and yeah, whether you could comment on that a bit. Yeah, thank you. So I th it's a good question and, and it's something, you know, DEFRA have been quite clear that they don't want to exclude other payments so that you know they although they recognize they might need to contribute they also want to sort of keep it open and those benefits you know the fact that so many of you have resisted the lure of George Eustace to come and you know listen to this suggests that there's lots of farmers that are interested in planting trees I'm guessing not everybody has done it yet uh, and as Stephen said it's it, part of it that is about the de-risking so you know there's a lot of upfront cost and there's potentially quite a long term return on that investment whether it's a product uh, and not all trees are planted to create a product you know sometimes it's about shade or shelter for livestock for instance so you will get those benefits some of those benefits will happen quite soon other benefits might happen quite a long time you've got obviously the potential for government support but also the potential for carbon or you know biodiversity offsetting um, and I think what's holding a lot of people back is there's a real nervousness about some of those private offsetting opportunities. You know, there's a lot of potential, but there's also, you know, the, like anything, there'll be some good ones and there'll be some really dodgy ones that you won't want to touch with a barge pole and working out which is which at the moment is, is hard. Um, so I think the role in a way for government at the moment is to kickstart that process. It's to de-risk the, you know, the planting, you know, if we want everybody, every farmer that's interested in planting trees at the moment, if we really want to sort of push them over the line and support them to do that, there needs to be, I think, there needs to be some trusted government support, you know, we may not trust the government in one sense, but, you know, in terms of taking money from them to help our farms, they're quite trustworthy, you know, rather than, uh, you know, a venture capitalist who might have other motives. So I think, I think the role in a way is, you know, they, They've made it clear that their priorities for agroforestry support are around carbon and biodiversity. Um, you know, there are obviously water quality, air quality, you know, flood mitigation. There's a, there's a whole range of stuff, but, but they're seeing, initially, they're seeing the main drivers for agroforestry as carbon and biodiversity. Um, but that won't happen until we get trees in the ground. And so I think it's, it is that kind of, it's helping us get over the line, you know. And there's yeah. some farmers like Helen, who I work with, like, you know, like Stephen, there's people who are sort of going, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, because I can, I'm really convinced of the benefits. Not everyone is convinced of the benefits, and, and certainly I think in uh, silver arable systems, silver horticultural systems, I think it's harder to get it right. You know, I think in a lot of livestock systems, I think it's much easier, but um, it's more complicated when you're mixing it with crop. And if I haven't got the confidence that it's definitely going to deliver, I'm going to hold off. Whereas if the government is saying, well, actually, we'll give you a bit of money to help do that and, and allow you to experiment and allow you to see whether it works for your system. I think that, for me, is sort of the role. Yeah. Excellent. OK, thanks a lot. Um, conscious of time, I want to move on to the, the final sort of um, building blocks recommendations um, that we've kind of uh, distilled from our uh, workshops with farmers over these last months. And uh, so this set of six are um, about the kind of whole area of advice and guidance. So. Um, firstly, recognising the various ways that farmers access um, advice and information on agroforestry. There isn't a one-stop shop. Um, of course, there are some really great resources like the Agroforestry Handbook and so on, but you know, farmers uh, learn in different ways, obviously. And uh, so kind of a range of different advice providers um, have been and will continue to be important in, in supporting um, people adopting agroforestry. 
But there's also, as well as different ways of accessing that knowledge, there's the kind of many different kind of types of knowledge and information that are needed in terms of for, for doing agroforestry. Um, so it's not just about the, the practicalities of the, the trees, uh, choosing which tree species, um, the planting designs, the densities, uh, where you source the tree stock and the protection um, initially in, in the early years and so on. It's that kind of practical stuff. But it's also the, the economics, the kind of developing the, the kind of business um, model and so on. Uh, and it's around the different kind of the biodiversity and carbon benefits and how you kind of maximize those and other environmental benefits as well. So there's a range of different um, types of information that are needed and it's difficult perhaps to conceive that they would all be from the same source. Uh, thirdly, recognizing the kind of relatively low baseline of agroforestry know-how and um, therefore sort of looking at, at how farmers can be signposted to the advice and guidance that they need and um, initially to, to be facilitated to adopt relatively uh, simple and adaptable approaches. Encouraging farmer to farmer knowledge exchange. I think this is a kind of key, actually, and I think it's something that you know, is, is observed through the agroforestry open weekends that have been running for the last couple of years, um, providing um, funding for demonstration farms, um, potentially offering sort of um, learning vouchers um, to, so that farmers are enabled to go out there and to, um, to, to find the information that they need. Recognize the importance of locally adapted design and therefore um, information, knowledge, advice that is actually relevant to their local situation that, that isn't from the other half part of the country where the, the environment is very different, uh, with the characteristics are, are, are so different. And finally, kind of recognizing the benefits of local collaboration. And I think these, in a sense, those, these two things go together. So it's sort of achieving cost efficiency, uh, access to required knowledge, um, in a perhaps more of a kind of collegiate corporate way, uh, looking for ways and that that can happen uh, within particular regions, particular clusters of farms. So they're kind of the kind of main uh, headline messages, quite a lot of detail behind those, which we put into our report to DEFRA, but just wanted to uh, ask Helen really to comment on this because Helen's been sort of um, instrumental in the, uh, the Woodland Trust scheme that supports, has been supporting farmers for, for many years to plant trees on their farms and to do so really well and, and ways that that work for them. And I just kind of wanted to ask you, Helen, what, what you've observed in terms of the, um, the knowledge, the information that farmers have needed to, to be able to do this. Obviously, Wooden Trust have been helping to provide that. But uh, to comment on that and really how you would see that working, I suppose, in terms of the ELM schemes through the SFI, through LNR, um, given the constraints that there will be for funding for that. Thanks, Will. Yeah, as Will says, we've been running Trees for Your Farm since 2013. It's very much a pilot agroforestry scheme. And the way that we run it is that we do provide farmers with free advice. So one of our advisors will go out and actually visit the farmer, walk, walk, walk together and understand the objectives and you know, design the scheme together. Um, and then we do provide the, the trees and the protection. So it's you know obviously we are giving that advice, but the message we regularly sort of We've built very good relationships with a lot of the farmers who've received funding through the scheme, but also we've, we, last year we did a survey to all of those who had uh, um, ever received it since 2013. And one of the strong messages that came back was that the advice that we gave, and we don't claim to be the experts, you know, we're coming in with our tree, tree advice and we're, we're working with the farmer who has the farming advice uh, knowledge, um, was that the advice really gave them the confidence to try it. So, okay, we were also providing the funding uh, in terms of providing the trees and guards, but they were going to have to make a serious investment in time and the long-term care of those trees. So it was, you know, we, we view it as a, a very equal partnership, but it was the fact that we were providing that advice that, that gave them the confidence to try it. But they've also, you know, a lot of the feedback has said we... We need more. You know, it's not just about the advice of designing the scheme and getting it planted and established. It's now those schemes are getting quite mature, some of the early ones. It's, well, we don't have the expertise in terms of thinning or pruning or, you know, so there's lots of different types of advice and ongoing training that, that we, we're, the messages we're getting back. So I suppose we do have a concern that the, the way that the SFI is being designed is that it is guidance only, uh, and that you know farmers will have to go out and find the advice elsewhere. So I think that I'm sure that can be solved, and we can be quite creative working with DEFRA um, and Natural England and Forestry Commission to make sure that we can be as creative as possible within those constraints. But I think 
Agroforestry is one of the things that's the only thing probably that's completely new that looks like it's going to be supported in SFI. And I think, yeah, we do collectively need to work together to work out how we can best share that best practice. So, you know, whether we have a demonstration farm network where the farmers like Stephen are paid to pr offer so many farm walks a year. Yeah, I'm sure that would be good music to your ears. Um, but yeah, I think think we do otherwise there is a real risk that we get the, the wrong tree in the wrong place and it will fail not only for the farm business but it will not deliver those public goods that it's also capable of doing yeah thanks i, I mentioned the um this idea of a learning voucher and that came out a couple of times in our, our workshops just wondered if you could sort of in your view perspective what you think that would, could look like and how it would work I mean, I think it sounds like a really exciting opportunity, and it definitely, yes, it was a lot of the feedback from the workshops that we got, and it allows uh, farmers to, to learn in the way that they, they learn to learn. And I do think, as representing an environmental NGO, then we can use our way of raising money to be part of possibly the one, one of um, several different delivery options of that. It would need a framework. I think DEFRA would have a role to play in, in con, you know, creating a framework as well and to make sure that the quality of that advice was either accredited or you know, met certain standards. Um, so yeah, I think it needs a lot of thinking, but it sounds really, really sensible way to go forward. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so these kind of, in a sense, were our 16 findings. Um, it's also quite sort of useful, I think, to keep our, our eyes on what's going on across the, the channel. Obviously, we're in a divergent sort of policy con context now. Um, and support for, for agroforestry has seen kind of an incremental growth in, um, in, in policy ter terms across Europe. Um, and just wanted to say a couple of things, based, based actually on a piece of work that has been done as part of the Agrimix project by Jesse Donham and, and Rosemary Venn and, and, and others, um, actually reviewing the kind of what's going on in terms of the, the uh, European policy and how that's implemented in, in the different countries. Um, so agriculture has been sort of recognized as part of the two, two cap periods up to 2020, and it's also um, integrated into the, the, the new cap that's we starting next year. Um, it's, it's embedded in the biodiversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy, the European Green Deal, where it's recognized for its value to, for biodiversity, for climate, for resilient jobs, for landscape enhancement. So there's a, yeah, it's, it's well recognized. It's, it's kind of there in the policy uh, documents um, and to different degrees. Um, that kind of obviously filters through to actually the practice on the ground. So. Different countries um, implement CAP in different ways, of course, uh, to different degrees of financial support and success. And this was what the, uh, this team were actually reviewing across the board. And in some countries, the, the, for example, the CAP measure 8.2 is part of the 2014 to 2020 CAP, which is to support for the establishment and maintenance of agroforestry systems. Um, that's not implemented everywhere. Um, but in a large number of countries it is. In some of those same countries, there's also national or regional support um, instruments for, for agroforestry as well. So countries either have one um, or both or none of these things. Um, and probably the country which is put up there as being one of the, the best in terms of an extensive policy landscape for agroforestry is France, uh, where there is both CAP and um, CAP support and regional support. But I think the, 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 the policy and the degree to which there are financial instruments that support that, um, obviously that's kind of um, one thing, but it's not the only push factor. And I, I think there's patchy data in terms of farm uptake in, in these different countries, but it's not just about the, the finance. There is the knowledge exchange kind of need. Um, there's the kind of traditions of land management as the starting point for any kind of new agroforestry measure. So all of these sorts of things, factors come into to play. Uh, in quite a complex uh, way, I think. But I think the um, conclusion of this report was the types of policies that are most beneficial to agroforestry, ones that, that support the traditional systems. And indeed, they're not just traditional on the continent, they're traditional agroforestry systems, uh, such as parklands and wood pasture here in Britain too. Um, so um, they, the, you know, the most beneficial systems actually supporting those and, and also the implementation of new systems and yearly support for the management of those new systems. 
And I think it's probably an important lesson as we talk about Elm, the Elm scheme and agroforestry that, yes, we shouldn't just be fixated on the, the finan financial um, kind of support, the, the, the standards, agroforestry standards under SFI and LNR, but there is the whole range of other enabling factors that we've already started to discuss, I think, um, which are important as well. Um, Stephen, you, you, you know some agroforesters in countries like France um, and Belgium, and I know you're sort of in touch with them a lot. Have you got any sort of, can you add to any, any perspectives on, on what's going on across the channel and how we can learn from those? Um, I, I guess it would be fair to say that we're, we're playing catch up in this country. I mean, you alluded to the, the current round of the CAP. Well, agroforestry establishment and ongoing management has, has been funding under pillar two of the cap since 2010, 2010. So for a long time, you know, 22, 10, 12 years. Um, in the UK or UK devolved governments decided not to make that available and to UK farmers uh, under the last two rounds of the CAP. And now things are starting to change. So in many of the, many of the European countries, there is a greater uptake. In France, Italy, um, Hungary, Romania, as an example, that they've now embedded agroforestry into their, their national targets. So France want to see 10% of land use under agroforestry by 2030. Now, that's a pretty punchy target, but um, they're, they're a long way further down the line than we are already because they've been, they've been doing things a lot longer. So I think it's fair to say on a European basis, there is a... Uh, uh, certainly a, a raising of awareness and, and, and greater adoption than we've seen here, but I think we're going in the right direction now and the, the, the building blocks within policy are starting to fall into place. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Do we by any chance have any farmers from France or Belgium or Hungary or any other countries in Europe? A long shot. We do. Okay, yeah. Are you, do you do agroforestry? Have you thought? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, have you got any kind of. Um, the Dutch, yeah, the Dutch and the French and all that, they kind of embed it way more. It's like, uh, I think it's just because, I guess, um, we're more traditional here and they're more progressive in a certain way. Like, it comes through the universities more. Like, I'm talking to the, the, the university I studied at in the Netherlands, and they've started up a whole module for agroforestry now. It's now embedded in all the education. It's, you know, it's what the actual young people want to, you know, learn. And I think that the ageing uh, population, uh, farmer population in this country is also kind of semi-stifling it because obviously it's old traditions with new models. Uh, that's what I would think, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. That, that's really interesting. Um, well, now actually is the time in which we do want to hear from, from you guys, really, uh, as kind of to reflect on kind of the things that we've been sharing from our test project um, to, to maybe challenge us with any ideas, things that you think we haven't been picking up, which would be particularly important for you to, to see addressed in order for you to be encouraged to, to plant trees on your farms. Um, so open to you, really, please. And we do have the right roving... I My guess the question is, is well to the audience is, you know, if if, Elm, if Elms under SFI and, and local nature recovery, you know, what will it take for you as, as land managers and farmers to tip the balance to say maybe to yes, we're actually going to do it? What, what would you want to see in LN, LNR and, and NSFI to make you think, yep, that's something I want to I want to sign up to? Yeah. Um, so, so we have started putting in a bit, of, a bit of agroforestry and some woodland creation as well. And the difficulty we have with it is the boundary between the woodland creation and the agroforestry and our existing organic pasture land. And so it needs to be, we need to have more clarity about how we can treat that and how we treat the woodland, the farmland, the agroforestry. Because for me, they all need to be the same. That they're, they're all doing the same job. And they, you know, we want the animals to be going from the uh, organic uh, sort of arable land when they're in the, on that rotation into the agroforestry through into the woodland and be able to move them, use the whole farm as, as like a kind of, use the whole farm basically. 
And it, the minute is really difficult. A, it's just full of kind of acronyms, and and it's just you, you just get lost in it. E- even here, you know, and I've done quite a lot of research into it. You think, Jim, what does that mean? What what does that stand for? Who who's control of that bit? You know, that's you have to go and speak to the Forestry Commission, or you have to go and speak to someone else for that bit. And that that's the hardest bit, I think, at the minute is just the kind of getting through the bureaucracy of it all and understanding which bit you need to go and look at and that's why advisors are so important as well yeah just to, it was interesting we went the we were up in north wales last week with the farm woodland forum um and we went to visit one farmer who uh, has, has felled some you know some spruce that was there before and they've got this lovely natural regeneration he's got some pigs in there uh but he what he'd love to do is to restore that to a wood pasture and let some of them grow but actually, you know, and then there's opportunities of ash dieback, for instance, where sort of things, you know, you've lost a significant number of trees. Suddenly you've got a perfect opportunity to create a lovely agroforestry system, but you're tied into, uh, you know, a, a sort of a particular way of looking at that land that's classified. And you can't, you know, so there, there's definitely some real challenges, both from planting trees, but also from using existing, you know, woodland or, or forestry. I, I think the challenge is we've had a, historically, we're, we're, lumbered with a polarized system of it's either forestry or it's agriculture we're moving to a different place but it's a it's a difficult birth uh, let's just say that and um, not helped by the fact that the forestry legislation around uh, felling licenses around um, any, anything more than 20 percent canopy cover is classed as forestry uh, it is frankly, materially unhelpful when we come to sort of talk about agroforestry. But there is a, at least there's a recognition now that these things um, can be blockers. But in answer to your specific question or comment, um, I I guess the most relevant change was back in 2011, anything with more than 50 trees a hectare to it became a land use change from agriculture to forestry. That's moved to 100 trees per hectare now and there's a recognition as a uh, outside of europe by government that actually the under sfi uh, and also uh, lnr under elms and, and by the rpa now that if you can carry out agricultural practice of uh, where, where there is a mixture of trees and um, livestock or cropping then, then that land remains eligible now as an agricultural parcel of land. It never becomes forestry. So the forestry stuff is, is sort of a bit more fixed and a little bit more difficult to move in terms of the, the, the filing licenses and, uh, and the, the, the embedded legislation. But the agricultural context, if you plant trees, it can still remain agricultural and give you that flexibility. And I think that's really important in terms of giving you confidence in, in terms of adapting that multifunctional land use. Okay. I'm just wondering if it's worth making the comment as well that when um, DEFRA first introduced the idea of, of ELM, they were talking about it being based on a land management plan and that it would you know, look at the whole holding and work out you know, what are the best actions for the farmer to take in terms of delivering those public goods. And you know, we know there's lots of tests on that, so we're hoping that that's still... Um, going to be taken forward but uh, you know they've obviously rolled out some standards which are just individual standards what is encouraging is there is a farm woodland standards that's automatically bringing in that that sort of aspect that wouldn't have been considered before but i think you know agroforestry as you say does require that whole farm approach and i think that is an important message that we perhaps need to give back to defra however challenging it is yeah so is that all um, so one point that we have is if, if you want to do some woodland creation and you want to do agroforestry um, and you want to protect those trees and you want to ring fence the farm from the, from deer, uh, so like 400 acres ring fence from deer, you can't do that and join the fences mm-hmm. together at the minute. So, so that you know that's a big barrier to getting it done and it means you end up putting loads of internal fences up to, so you keep deer off your... Uh, woodland creation then you keep deer off your agroforestry but we don't want to do that we want to keep deer out the whole thing yeah. because that that better for biodiversity and the whole project to develop so cheaper on fencing as well yeah. <laughs> right thank you any, any other comments or questions here david um St- steve you said i think that one of the reasons you chose fruit trees was because you've got a short-term return on the fruit because of your particular situation 
um, other people will want to plant timber trees, which have a much longer term return on financially. Forget anything else. And is the payments regime going to be able to reflect any of those things? So, ultimately, as, as Will alluded to, the, the drivers for the SFI and, and LNR are going to be around carbon and biodiversity. Um, that, that, that's what's driving, driving gov public money. Um, the, the economic considerations from the output of those trees actually DEFRA aren't really that bothered by. If you want to make money out, out of it, short term or long term, well then that's fine by them. If you want to co-finance it from private private money, that's sort of fine by them. They, that's the sort of reading on the wall. Um, so the, the economic return conundrum is down really to the, I suppose, the, uh, the needs and desires of, of the landowner or the land manager in terms of when you need that return on investment. So whether it's, a, whether it's 150 years as an oak tree or whether it's 20 years as a poplar tree or whether it's five years as a, you know, a, a fruit tree, actually, the, the, the DEFRA will support all of those. So, so, Helen, does that mean we're seeing a lot of people planting lines of fruit trees? Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've got quite a few of our advisors here at the event, and yeah, we've had we have seen a lot of interest in apple trees, but increasingly now a lot are now considering doing um, you know timber trees. It requires a lot more thought, and I think it is it 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 really heightens that lack of join up between the forestry and agricultural sectors in terms of uh, of understanding and training and expertise. But no, we've got some good schemes um, where now it's timber in interdispersed with others. So you know, I'm sure John Pawsey won't mind me referencing him, but you know, he's he's got a, an objective of timber, mimicking his triple SI ancient woodland. It's got nursery trees which will have some timber potential, and then it's got some browse trees for when he's got his grassland uh, lays in his rotation. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We have seen quite a lot of apple trees. And Ben, I know, has an opinion on whether we're going to oversupply the market in that case. But also nuts, you know, that's some things. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's beginning to change. I, I had a question as well for you, David, because obviously, you know, you've got a very established system um, and a lot of it is short rotation coppice. So if, you know, if there is payment for ongoing maintenance or carbon payment. So we've just had some funding approved to develop an agroforestry carbon code, which is, you know, will be slightly different from some of the other codes. You know, what would tempt you, you know, would it make a difference to you as an established farm, you know, and, and you know, are you still sequestering carbon, say, on those mm. rotations, or have you reached equilibrium and the same on diversity, you know? So how does, it, in terms of a very established model, how would that affect you and what, what difference would it make? I mean, I think one of the things about Wakelands is we've actually got effectively five different agroforestry systems, including an example which is like Steve's fruit trees and an example at the other end which is timber trees. So the result of that is that each bit of agroforestry is very small in the scheme of things. I mean, tiny compared to Steve's piece. Um, and so any payment scheme that is effectively area-based, the actual amounts of money for us are really quite small. Um, so although I am interested in the um, what do these schemes do for first movers who took the risk before their incentives, actually the amounts of money involved are probably not going to make much difference to us, to be honest. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, one of the conversations we've had around this permanency issue, um, and, you know, so A, how do you reward people that have done it? But B, also, how do you uh, ensure that if it's not permanent, so if you say, OK, it's different to a forest or a woodland where we're, we're assuming that it won't be forever, how do you sort of make sure it's in there for as long as possible? And one of the ideas that came up through the workshops was this sort of almost a kind of an added incentive the longer you have it in. So the payments sort of go up if it's if the trees have already been there for you know 20 years or 50 years. So you, you sort of incentivize people to hang on to those systems, even though you know they could sort of you know rip them up and change them or do something with them. So okay, another question or um, comment. Yeah, so is it possible to use the woodland carbon guarantee as well as the Elms payment? And equally, would it be possible to grow the trees in hedgerows and then use the agroforestry standard and the hedgerow standard on the same alleys? Uh, no. <laughs> Sim simplistically, uh, the Woodland Carbon Code is based upon forestry densities, and most agroforestry systems will be at a much lower density. So 
the, the Woodland Carbon Code and on the guarantee fund on carbon wouldn't be applicable. But as Ben said, there are moves afoot to look at an agroforestry carbon code, which will be looking at different densities. As far as hedgerows is concerned, the hedgerow standards, I guess, will pick that up. Uh, even though hedgerows are a form of agroforestry, it, it's it, it, there's going to be a separate standard for hedgerows. And, and there's also, you know, there's quite a lot of farmers are putting in, you know, wildflower strips and planting the trees into that. So getting the payment for the wildflower strip while the trees established. So there's, there are ways of sort of juggling stuff. Great. Got a hand in the centre here and then one on the, my left. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Um, I was wondering if there's any funding or policy that has a mycological bent. So ectomycorrhizal fungi, truffle orchards, porcini orchards. Is there anything or any kind of information going on about that? Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? I don't <laughs> think there is, but I'd be great. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think, well, I certainly haven't seen any funding for that. I certainly, you know, just empirically, I, I visited a really nice farm in France about 15 years ago um, that had was doing some, some truffle um, uh, cultivation is that the right word? R truffle raising, um, only to learn that fruit, well, apple trees in my case are one of the few trees that don't associate with those the, the, those truffles. Uh, damn! Uh, um, so I missed a trick there. But um, I don't think there's any public funding. But I think this is a good point to to mention that actually I think there's a massive opportunity for perhaps private corporate fi co-financing. Um, I certainly went to some very big corporates 15 years ago and said, hi, guys, I'm going to plant a big area of agroforestry. Do you want to throw, throw some funding at me and, and do a bit of corporate social responsibility and offsetting or whatever? And had lots of doors closed in my face. It, I think if you had those conversations today, you'd have a, a very different experience. So that, that I think there might be some, you know, get, go and talk to some food businesses about truffles and about corporate finance, I think you'd have a different conversation. I think it's, yeah, it's interesting. And also, you know, with biodiversity offset money, I don't necessarily think any of them are thinking about fungus, but why not? You know, so, you know, there are companies looking at rewarding specific increases in specific species. Why not say, well, actually, fungi is one of them. So let's let's work specifically on measuring and building that. So, yeah. Great. Hand over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it was just a question. Have you thought about what a framework could look like for agroforestry on tenanted land so that landlords and tenants can share the benefits from future carbon or biodiversity markets? Great, great question, because I mean, with 30% of 32% of land tenanted, and trees being a long term project, it's a potential blocker. And, and I think there's an opportunity for uh, co-benefit and shared ownership so maybe maybe the asset that is the tree remains in ownership of the, the landowner whereas the uh, the income during the tenure period of, of the tenant and any income from uh, government or private programs goes to that manager I think that's where the sort of shared shared structure could could work um, certainly if, it, historically, if you look look on some very old maps of estates, you would find every tree mapped on those maps because they were a capital asset. And it's only really in the last 70, 80 years that tree values have have declined due to synthetic materials. Um, but I think we're seeing a change in that. And uh, and you know, the, I think there'd also need to be a recognition of the differing value of different trees over time. You know, so. I imagine you're not far off paying for your trees by now, whereas if it was an oak tree, you'd be nowhere near because you still got you know 80 years before before it realizes its value. So you know how much the tenant has put in a value and how much it's worth at any one point of time is always changing, and having a, an agreement that can reflect that for different species is you yeah. know will be. I guess just to add to that is actually there needs to be some imagination in tenancy agreements. 
it's not black and white, and, and actually that com the conversations between tenants, tenants and landlords to reflect these these sort of more imaginative approaches is really important. So, you know, sack the current land agent and get get we we'll get one in, involved that's a bit more imaginative, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> okay, I think this this will have to be our last uh, comment or question. I'm afraid because we're running out of time. Yeah, I'll try and be quick. Um, we have 180 acres of natural ancient woodland and we have 23 longhorn cattle and we have 100 acres of wildflower meadows. Um, my husband's very cross with me because the cattle are grazing the wildflower meadows much quicker than we wanted them because we have a lot of beautiful orchids. So he's desperate for me to get them into the woods. Has anyone done this in the room? Because I've been slightly nervous about it, um, but I'm very happy to do it. I, I've got colleagues probably in the audience who are more experienced than me, but the Woodland Trust, obviously we do do some conservation grazing in our own woodlands um, and have worked with other landowners. I and mean, the message that I get from my more expertise colleagues is very much that it's a bespoke, you need a bespoke management plan for every situation. So it's not something you could just sort of take guidance off a, a shelf with. Um, but it, you know, it can be really beneficial for the woodland and the underground flora and obviously the cattle, um, but it, you know you can equally get it very wrong, and it's all about timings and stocking densities. So, um, yeah, it's something that you know should we sh we are keen to encourage, but it really does need the right level of advice and guidance, and that knowledge being you know transferred across the in interested sectors. Thanks, Helen. Just yeah, I mean, just to say that there are there are people grazing, uh, you know, grazing woodlands. Around the country, one of our testing trials down in the southeast um, looked very, you know, quite had a strong focus on that. Uh, yeah, okay. So we could make a speak to us afterwards, and we can make a connection. But a good starting point is you've got the right kind of cattle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, yeah, unfortunately, I've got to wrap up now. But thanks everybody for your your questions and comments. And I've just put on this slide our. Um, contact details, and if anybody who didn't get to, to raise their hand or, or get get noticed, then please you know, feel free to get in touch with us. Things are moving pretty rapidly in terms of the development of the support through Elms, through SFI and LNR. So, you know, keep watch this space. Uh, we're trying to keep pace ourselves in our project. Very finally, there is a walk to actually see a silver arable sort of system locally. Um, so, Paul Woodgate at the Wood Woodland Trust um, is should be around, and I think, um, yep, stand hi there, up. Hi, stand hi, Paul. up, Paul. So if you'd like to, I think it's about a 15, 20 minute walk, is that right? Uh, I, I did it in the hot sun yesterday, it felt like it. Um, but yeah, no, if you want, want to see some, some uh, trees in the field. When is that? Now. Now, yeah, sorry, it's right now, yeah. So yeah, thanks again for your participation and I, um, you know, stay tuned, thank you. Thank you.